Hi, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. Okay, I'm back today with another five albums video, the series that actually birthed this channel and this community that's watching. Today I'm going to be giving you five albums to get you into jazz fusion. One of my all-time favourite genres of music, jazz fusion and players such as Billy Cobham, John McLaughlin and Victor Wooten are what made me fall in love with performing music in the first place. It's It really does hold a special place in my heart because of that. Before we jump into the list, what is jazz fusion exactly? Jazz fusion, or sometimes confusingly just known as fusion, marks the point where jazz musicians began exploring beyond the limits of jazz expression. This primarily started as electric instrumentation gained more of a precedent in the music world, offering up a new palette for these individuals to perform, record, and experiment with. All of a sudden you have this crossover where improvisation, soloing, and free expression was incorporating elements of rock and funk, so the music that was being made using these electric instruments was now being bought into the jazz world. Now I just mentioned that the term fusion can be a little bit confusing, I'll explain. As with any genre, there are a number of subgenres building out of the jazz fusion moniker. So you have things like punk jazz, acid jazz, jazz metal. And while they are all fusion, because they are fusing two different styles together, the, the jazz fusion that I'm talking about today is primarily uh, the, the original fusion sound, which is the fusion of jazz and rock. That's the original, the original moniker, the original framework of fusion as an idea. This is the reason most of my picks today are from the 1970s, because it's at the time where fusion really began to flourish, um, and these a lot of the key players came out of this out of this period. Although I have picked one record at the end of the video that's slightly more contemporary, so you can get a flavour for where maybe fusion went as we were getting closer and closer to the new millennium. This is also the reason you won't find something like Herbie Hancock's Headhunters on this list, because yes, you could call it fusion, but I would probably class it more as jazz funk because it's because of its repetition and its focus on groove, it's, it's relatively structural simplicity. So that's the reason I haven't included a groundbreaking album like Headhunters on this list. But anyway, let's get this show on the road. Number one, Miles Davis with Bitches Brew, released in 1970. Couldn't really have started off with any other album, <laughs> to be honest. Actually, I could have, because the legendary jazz trumpeter Miles Davis's first real fusion release was actually 1969's In a Silent Way. This album is, is the follow-up to that record. Uh, and it's another groundbreaking Davis release, definitely worth checking out alongside Bitches Brew. 1970s Bitches Brew, I'm pretty sure every single person ever has heard of this album at least, maybe a few less have actually listened to it, maybe less than that even have enjoyed it. Um, it in no small way changed the face of music, and jazz specifically. This monumental album was a result of Miles pivoting after reigning as the king of jazz for so many years with albums like Miles Smiles, Kind of Blue, Sketches of Spain. He swapped out his famed quartet for a muscular band featuring future masters like Wayne Shorter, Chick Corea, John McLaughlin, Jack D. Jonette, Larry Young, Dave Holland. This is a who's who of great fusion players, yet again more evidence, if evidence was needed, of Davis's unparalleled influence. It must also be mentioned that this masterpiece of a record was recorded in only three days. Yeah, three days. Unreal. Bitches Brew runs for nearly two hours, and what always gets me when listening to this record is the presence of a flowing sound that envelops you as a listener. Sections and ideas, they melt into one another. Even moments of steady groove feel as if they're flexing and temporary. A lot of this I think comes down to the backline courtesy of drummers Lenny White and Jack D. Jonette. They both have this ability to provide a strong percussive presence but without ascribing to a kind of rigidity. Uh, their playing is textural, it grooves then wanders in and out just like the ethereal melodies of Davis's trumpet on this record. Miles knew exactly what he had in this incredibly talented band and I think it makes that quite clear when you listen to track two, Pharaoh Dance. His own line doesn't even come in for until about the second minute, because he allows Chick Corea's mystical keyboard tones and Dave Holland's bass to create this unsettling texture, and they do that so well, and he understands the building blocks of this band. He's not about just whittling all over every single other player. He understands how to construct these mystical textures. When he finally lets rip, although he is soloing, it feels more like an addition of colour than sort of showing off his... Um, 
his unbelievable performance ability, which he, you know, we've seen him, we've heard him do on all of these previous records he's released. The band just works so well together throughout this track, building up across the 20 minute running time. John McLaughlin's unmistakable angular guitar playing has such a presence across Bitch's Brew, and the inclusion of that musical timbre, I think, is a reminder that this really was a step forward away from the conventional sounds of jazz. I won't go into McLaughlin too much right now because we, he will be turning up more on this list as we get through it. Davis's freakish explosions on title track Bitches Brew are just, they're brilliant, and he holds these really, really high notes as drums, Fender Rhodes piano and guitar create this cacophony that just once again envelops the listener. One of the most important records of all time, and it has such a rich history to it. You've got, there's so much you can read about this record, and I suggest if you like the sound of it, go out and read all the material around it because it's just such a fascinating piece of work, a landmark work. Also, if you like this, check out 1971's Live Evil record. Um, it's a mixture of live and studio recordings, and it has so much power to it. I uh, really recommend you checking that out. Number two, Mahavishnu Orchestra, The Inner Mounting Flame, released in 1971. This is what personally got me into jazz fusion, an absolute belter and by all accounts, one of my favorite albums of all time. Mahavishnu Orchestra was created by John McLaughlin in New York in 1971. Yes, that is the same John McLaughlin that we were just talking about in Bitches Brew. We just talked about incredible lineups on Miles Davis's 1970 record, and this album has another one. You have Billy Cobham on drums, Jan Hammer on keyboards, Rick Laird on bass, Jerry Goodman on the violin. It's a shit hot band, as you will discover if you listen to this record and it proceeds to blow your mind, which I'm pretty sure it will. This is a very different beast to Bitches Brew. In many ways, a better example of a fusion record perhaps, because, or the way that fusion moved towards a different sound in its 70s and away from jazz a little bit more. You know, some would argue Bitches Brew is almost a, a proto-fusion record in the way that, same way that something like Jesus and the Mary Chain Psycho Candy is considered proto-shoegaze. And in some ways I'm inclined to, to agree with that that assessment, but I couldn't leave Bitches Brew off of this list because I think it is very important in terms of a fusion record and to understand where fusion started and where it continued to go and where it ended up. Anyway, the salient difference between Bitches Brew and the Inner Mounting Flame, Mahavishnu Orchestra's first record, is the focus on tight groove. This doesn't mean a repetition though, because these tracks are anything but repetition filled but this music is structured around a groove and the entire band lean into that especially on opening track meeting of the spirits this track kicks things into gear in style Cobham bursting between cymbal hits and these feral drum fills whilst McLaughlin provides atmosphere with his famed double guitar neck he's got a six string and a 12 string on his guitar a Jan Hammer's interjecting with these dissonant chords the entire thing just bristles with energy as the track continues forward Jerry Goodman arrives with this circadian violin melody that sounds so majestic and it adds a real dramatic weight to the track and then McLaughlin finally hits his solo a blistering bit of work that provides evidence of his demonstrable talent as a guitar player what I love about this record and what seems to be captured on every single track of this record is just the energy of the band whilst they do play in an incredibly cohesive way many moments of these performances feel raw a little bit rough around the edges which is something they perhaps lost a little bit on later records like Bird of fire. As an example, on third track Noon Race, the band keeps returning to this rhythmic refrain and Cobham sits slightly forward on the beat. It's almost as if he's risk at risk of losing the band, going a little bit too ahead of the rest of the band. Uh, this isn't a bad thing. Um, you know, some drummers sit slightly ahead of the beat, slightly behind the beat, and it gives you know, so much more of a, of a feeling to the record instead of a sort of rigidity dead on the beat. And Cobham, Cobham doing that, it just gives that rawness so much more intensity on the track. Uh, you know, it feels as if you're listening to an organic live performance that's unveiling before you. You can almost taste the sweat in the air because it feels like they're all just trying to hold on to this rhythmic refrain that's pummeling forward and then moving on to the next section and coming back to it again. It's a very successful implementation of just such a, a live, raw performance. The fact that Jan Hammer used a mini Moog on this album gave him an even greater palette of expression and soloing style on this album, and partially his solo on Noon Race is so unexpected because of the unusual tone that he goes for. Again, it's just it's changing the conventions and um, us working out exactly what fusion might mean, bringing in these interesting electronic sounds, electric sounds to, um, you know, sometimes challenging instrumentation as you might expect in jazz as a genre. His solo on Awakening as well, for instance, it's this frictional metallic din. It, j it just sounds so strange. Unreal, this album. 
Unreal. Number three, Return to Forever with Romantic Warrior, released in 1976. This time we go to a project created by Chick Corea, keyboardist of Bitches Brew, a very influential player in the world of fusion and jazz. He also converted to Scientology, but you know, Try not to let that put you off his music. Return to Forever began in 1972 and went through a number of iterations that had a bit of a revolving door in terms of personnel involved. By the time we hit 1976 and sixth LP Romantic Warrior is released, we have a really great lineup once again. So the same with all of these records I'm talking about today. You have Aldi Miola on guitars, Stanley Clark on bass, and Lenny White on drums. And Lenny White, who Chick Corea had previously played with on the record, Bitches Brew. See, that record does have so much to answer for. Chick Corea himself, of course, on keys for this record. He's a keyboard player, so there you go. Um, but the, the sheer number of different instruments that he implements on Romantic Warrior speaks to the diversity of sounds and styles that he's able to implement, he's able to achieve. You know, he plays an Arp Odyssey, a Fender Rhodes, Mini Moog, Marimba, Acoustic Piano. There are a couple of other ones as well, but they're, they're the main ones. But yeah, he's just able to command so many different sounds and styles with these different instruments. So I wanted to include this record because aside from being a very great fusion record, it's also very different stylistically to the last two fusion records I've spoken about. I think you'd be pretty hard pressed to argue that this isn't a fusion record. However, even if you ignore the slightly hokey medieval proggy front cover, there is something progressive rock about this record, as well as jazz and fusion. You know, the jazz expression and modes are there throughout, I think that's pretty clear as you listen to it, um, but un unlike the Inner Mounting Flame and Bitches Brew, everything is organized and uh, precision tight. You know, it's a very rehearsed record in terms of its performances. You know, everything that happens on each track is a result of everything being charted and organized, and as a result, Korea's band deliver exhilarating passages, bursting with these melodic flourishes and ideas. Every track jumps from idea to idea, never setting on a single thought. Straight out of the gate with opening track Medieval Overture, the band demonstrate a blistering dexterity. You know, Lenny White's kit work is up there with the best. Chick Corea is creating all kinds of angular and mystical otherworldly melodies and patterns across every keyed instrument known to man. My favourite track would have to be the title track. It's like the central gem of the record. The acoustic piano work that grounds this track is, is sensational. And even in moments of relative calm, every instrument is bristling. It, it's just bristles. That's how it feels. If you sit and listen and focus on an, one instrumental line at a time, you can, you can feel that brimming, bristling energy throughout everything that's here. It's amazing the flourishes and complexity on show in the instrumentation on this record. The moment that really sounds very medieval and takes that proggy influence is the track Magician. It, it reminded me of the Genesis record Selling England by the Pound, and I think the sonic style of that is very much why this LP is often described as prog, because it does have some of those hokey elements of progressive rock in there. Um, it's some of it almost is almost parodic in a kind of in a sort of cheesy way but it still works really well but you know to appease all people this is like a jazz fusion light prog record it's not it's not a prog album i don't believe but there are elements of that to it but i think ostensibly it is a jazz fusion record which is why i've included it on this and i, I think it's a really good album i think you should definitely go and listen to it number four Weather Report with Heavy Weather, released in 1977. Weather Report were an influential jazz fusion group formed in 1970 and like many other fusion groups went through a process of constant revision throughout their career. In the early days, Weather Report was masterminded by keys and synth player Joe Zawinul and Wayne Shorter, saxophonist Wayne Shorter, the same Wayne Shorter that proved himself in the 1960s alongside Miles Davis on records such as Miles Smiles, Miles in the Sky, In a Silent Way and of course, Bitches Brew. Shorter is a sax player that has a style you might not initially attribute to the jazz legends of the 60s. They're very much a textural player, certainly on this record anyway. He would rather add a subtle harmony or a tone and full on splurge over the music with a bombastic solo. And this textural approach adds to the unique sound of Weather Report as a band. Their style jumped around all over the place, going from the earlier avant-garde records to then the mid 70s with the more groove-based composition. And then when we finally hit 1977 and Heavy Weather is 
released, we find Weather Report at their most commercially successful and arguably also their most artistically successful. The inclusion of the lineup to arguably one of the greatest bass players of all time, Jaco Pastoris. I don't even know if that's arguable, to be honest. <laughs> He's just an unreal player. Alongside the lead track from Heavy Weather being the incredibly popular and eventual jazz standard Birdland, that's probably a track that you all have heard if you haven't listened to this record. Those two things really made this record a success. It's one of those very rare moments when commercial and artistic success collide in that way, but uh, the musicality of Jaco Pastoris' bass playing alongside Birdland being such a successful track really did elevate this record and it's become such a, a widely loved album. The variance of compositional styles on this album makes it, again, very different to the other records I've talked about today. You know, as opposed to battering you across the head with virtuosity like many fusion records would choose to do, um, the upbeat, even danceable Birdland is what opens the album up and it immediately warms you to the album, I think. It has this, uh, there's this inclusion of a synth brass section that it just, it colours and highlights that ever recognisable melodic line. I think a track like Teen Town really proves the influence that Jacko had on joining the band and the kind of compositions they were writing, the performances that they were giving. You know, the band pulse underneath Jacko's melodic spidery fretwork you know, um, achieving this smooth tone from the fretless bass that he's so well known for playing. Every now and then the band are kind of jumping in with these double push notes that really puncture everything, especially with the dry, snappy snare sound that we get. It's a very, a, oh, I'd, love to, I'd love to see this track live. You can probably track down some live recordings, but to be able to have seen these guys perform a track like this live would have been just mind-blowing. There's something in this track and a lot of the other tracks on this record that achieves both accessibility and complexity as well. They somehow show their cards whilst simultaneously being enigmatic as a band and enigmatic in their performance and that's a really uh, impressive thing to be able to do. The musicians create space throughout the tracks. You know, often Zawinol's arp chords will ring out as Alex Acuna rides an open hi-hat beat and Short is creating these breathy textures. All of these beautiful sounds coalescing and colliding uh, and yet there's there's something, it has a brevity to it, there's something quite light um, and uh, accessible feels like a really bad word to be using, but there is an accessibility to learning to really appreciate this music. Perhaps unlike other fusion records, you might struggle with something like Bitches Brew when you finally reveal, it reveals itself to you, you'll love it, um, whereas I feel like Heavy Weather is a really good place to begin with understanding fusion because I think it's it's not too difficult to get into and it's a really great album. Really want a taste of the virtuosity of this group you need to listen to Havana, the track Havana, and be inspired and then start at the beginning of the album. Number five, Vital Tech Tones with Vital Tech Tones released in 1998. And now for something a little bit more up to date although having said that this time next year will be the 20th anniversary of this album so you know we're still going back a little while. So in keeping with this list I've given you something completely different to end on today. This is a trio fusion group that out of all of the records on this list achieves the mantle of the most rock oriented. You know, it has a distorted crunch to it but it's not ragged like something like The Inner Mounting Flame. It, it's it's very virtuosic, incredibly tight playing from some of the best session players around. If you follow session players in music, these names will, will be familiar to you. You've got Victor Wooten, a prodigious bass player that is regularly called one of the best ever, because he is. Uh, you have Steve Smith, the human metronome on drums. He sits right on the beat and he's quite rigid, but he's also very colorful and varied with his playing. So he's got a really nice, a really nice feeling about, about everything he plays. And also you have Scott Henderson, a fusion player, guitarist, who also professes to be a blues player. And he often merges those two styles you can hear elements of blues melody in his soloing and in his chord progressions and he's worked with some of the fusion greats people like Jean-Luc Ponty, Chick Corea and Joe Zawinul of Weather Report. So yeah great trio lineup but why is this music so great? Vital Tech Tones is an hour stacked with moments that will make your jaw drop at what is being performed. The record begins with Crash Course and it immediately shows you how crisp the recording is. All three instruments have equal weighting in the mix intentionally. They want you to be able to hear every little note, every technical detail. Vital Tech Tones is very much part of that tradition in fusion uh, where the music is more about musicianship, performance and less about composition. You know, I don't think many people are going to be getting their pitchforks at the ready if I say that these tracks are not some of the best tracks ever written. <laughs> They're just not. Their primary focus is to reveal the incredible talent that these three guys have at playing and the cohesion that they can show. They're playing these 
blisteringly fast and complex passages of music, and it really does succeed in that regard. Snake Soda has these ridiculously quick 30 second note flourishes from Wooten. I'm not even sure how a human can move their fingers that fast. <laughs> Steve Smith effortlessly plants pushed notes with crisp hi-hat chokes, ghosting the snare, creating layers of texture around his propellant grooves. And Scott Henderson, while his solo technique flits from chromatic to infectious blues riffs to flighty jazz chords, that the, the tones and the sounds that he gets gets out of his guitar are amazing. Every track on this record is chock with these kind of moments. Check out King Twang for a rollicking rock and roll stomp approach to fusion. This record will not be for everyone, but I really wanted to include a fusion record that had a laser sharp focus on performance over songwriting, and I think Vital Tectone surely is that. And I'm really keen to see what your response is on a record like this, so please have a listen to it and let me know what your thoughts are. You know, do you find the songwriting a little bit too cheesy? Does that take away from the virtuosic playing? Or do you find that the playing is just so impressive that you don't really care about that, which is kind of the, the frame of mind I take? Let me know. Right, thank you very much for watching. That was my five albums to get you into Jazz Fusion. I have included the Spotify link to a playlist with all these albums on. I've done a more albums to get you into Jazz Fusion playlist, so there's loads of other records for you to check out because there are some uh, other amazing records I haven't had time to talk about today. Um, so make sure you check those out. Uh, I'll be back next week with this video, which I'm pretty sure is not going to get any ad revenue at all, but there we go. <laughs> Thanks for watching. See you next week.